Okay, hi, my name is Neil Wilde and I'm here today to run through um, this webinar on the subject of town centre assets and investment. So it's all about town centres, their property and ownership of those uh, properties. It's an online learning session. Uh, I'm a chartered surveyor, property consultant, and I'm an expert with the High Streets Task Force. So what I'm going to do today is talk you through town centre assets and investment. But before I do, just a little introduction about who I am, uh, where I'm coming to you from. So I'm based in North Oxfordshire. Uh, that's uh, my local high street on uh, one of its town events days in recent uh, years. Um, I'm a surveyor, chartered surveyor, uh, RICS. Uh, and a uh, property agent, property consultant. I'm involved in all types of landlord and tenant um, leasing on behalf of clients, buying and selling high street property. I've been doing this um, since the early 1990s and I've got a long standing history nationally in uh, property transactions and advice. Over the last 10 years, I've undertaken as well as this, uh, alongside my property consultancy work, um, I've undertaken uh, advice for local authorities in my region. I've been involved in schemes, um, town team organisation, um, town market um, consultation, um, support for small business, um, pop-up shops, meanwhile uses, um, other uh, strategies for assisting local authorities and town centres uh, seeking to boost town centre uh, vibrancy. I'm also uh, undertaking uh, consultancy work through the High Streets Task Force, which means providing some mentoring facilitation for certain local authorities, bringing about better town partnership working. The aim of this session um, on town centre assets investment um, is the following. It's to help us understand how the property market works in relation to high streets and town centres, explaining the different um, owners, owners and ownerships of high street property, their objectives, and giving a brief explanation of how property is valued and what yields are, understanding what these in, uh, the implications are for our towns, and then to um, consider the main changes that are taking place the property market and how these change, changes are impacting our towns and throughout all of this to pepper with examples of good practice and inspiration for us. So this forms part of a series by the High Streets Task Force. Um, it includes some basic concepts um, of a specific subject with practical examples and at the end you will see um, resources, further reading that you may undertake for yourself. Okay, so let's um, crack on and get, go through um, the session. Okay, what is property investment? Well, property produces an income, the rent, that's, that's the income that it produces. There, was, there is a lease, we have a landlord and we have a tenant. The tenant pays the landlord the rent. The landlord owns the building and the return that the landlord receives is, is the rental income. The tenant looks after the property. The rent and the lease directly impact the property's value. The higher the rent, the longer the lease, everything else being equal will give the higher property value. Um, how is it that property is valued? Well, we have the rent payable and then we have a multiplier. So the rent times the multiplier gives the value. So as I've said, the longer the lease, the stronger the covenant, the business, organization individual that's renting the property, the higher the multiplier. And it's the value as task to assess the, the, the multiplier. Multipliers are typically a number between 10 and 20. So if you had uh, a rent of 25,000 and you applied a multiplier of 10, that would give you a value of 250,000. And it's the value as task to determine whether 10 is the appropriate number to use. If we're going to any more details, I think we're probably then uh, stepping over the boundary into a webinar on property valuation, and that's not for today. But we do need to understand the yield, because yields are referred to uh, quite frequently. They're also one of the metrics used for assessing the vibrancy of a town. The lower the yield, it is felt that um, the, the stronger the vibrancy of the town, the lower the yield, the higher the value. But what do we mean by yield and how do we calculate it? So let's take the rent, the rent payable, 
or the expected rent payable if the property was empty. We call that the R, the rent. And then we take the value. That's the value of the building. So let's take an example and we'll use a calculator because property profession is a very simple bunch of people and calculators are always needed. So let's take uh, a rent example. We talked about a rent of 25,000 a moment ago. Let's stick with that number. That might be the rent that a business is paying on its property in a typical town center. Let's uh, assume that the owner of that building paid 500,000 pounds for that property. What is the yield? Well, let's take 25,000, we'll tap that into our calculator, divide it by 500,000, and that gives us a number. And we express that number as a percentage. So in that instance, 25,000 divided by 50, 500,000 gives us uh, a yield of five, a 5% 5 return. That's the return that that owner is expecting from its property based on the current rent. And it's for the owner and his advisors to guide the owner through that process of buying. Is that the right price to pay? Is 5% uh, an appropriate yield to be receiving for the investment of that property? Hopefully, a little glimpse into valuation and yields is helpful for understanding property investors and the, and the property um, ownership model. But who are these owners? Who are, you know, who are they? Here's a, an auction room full of prospective buyers of property. Now, I did a little bit of research on my local high street. And my research tells me that of the properties on my local high street, of which there are 95, over 90% of them are owned as investment. So they're owned with a, a, a landlord and there's a tenant uh, paying rent or the property's empty, but there would be a tenant if um, the owner had um, a, a tenant in place. Now, typically these owners are non-specialists. They uh, might own property as a side investment. They might be uh, private landlords, private individuals that have capital or borrow money uh, to enhance the capital that they have and purchase property. They might be small companies. They might be uh, private pension funds, SIPs or SASs. They uh, might be family trusts. There's lots of different structures that are in place, but typically our town centres are owned by non-specialist high street owners. There are exceptions, and I will refer to those and talk about those, but the days of large pension funds owning our high streets is long gone. Most properties are owned by individual people or individual peoples making up a company. And these assets are separately owned. What I mean by that, in the research that I've done on my local high street where there's 95 properties, around about 90 of those are owned by different people, different individuals, different companies. They're not owned in clusters. There's not one landlord with all of those properties. There's actually out of 95, 90 different owners on my local high street. Now, I find that kind of information quite interesting, but for your towns, what is the situation? It doesn't take that long to find these things out. And I would suggest it's an important um, piece of information to determine because then it leads us to understand what are the implications for our towns what does this mean now I over the years have represented some of these landlords who've purchased properties not this one uh, I'm pleased to say this long-standing empty building in my local town that I like to show uh, on a number of occasions and I have done over the last 10 years that it's been empty, this uh, listed building looking uh, rather sorry for itself in the heart of the town and was for a number of years let on paper, that is, with a tenant paying a rent to its landlord. Landlord thought it was let. It was, it was getting its income. The tenant knew it was let because it was having to pay the rent, but the town didn't think so because it was empty. An interesting scenario. But what we have as a result of this um, ownership a mixed ownership with lots of different landlords is that it's very fragmented very very challenging to have an overarching policy for one's town if most of the town is owned by different people geographically detached usually from their town with 
these owners aspiring to high values, the way of getting those high values is rental level and nice long lease. Now, if you've got businesses looking for short-term leases, they're startups, they're small businesses, or they're just looking for lease flexibility, so they're not tied in for a long period of time, because one can't predict the future, um, but you've got a landlord that's only aspiring to a nice long lease, you've got a problem. Um, and these problems hinder enterprise, they, they kind of hold back on um, those that are looking for property, wanting to take on property, but are not able to do so because there's a gap between their aspirations and the landlord's aspirations. Now, I think we probably need some positive um, examples of intervention, and, and we'll get to those. Don't worry, there are lots and lots of positives. I'm just painting a picture of how the market works. I personally believe I've got a good all-round knowledge and practice of the market. I've seen how it works well, but I've also seen where intervention is needed. The market, unfortunately, does not necessarily know what's always best for our towns and urban areas. The shopping centres do provide a town centre regeneration opportunity. There is, within, in the case of shopping centres, where they're typically at least 100 units strong, scope for an overarching asset management policy but they're full of challenges, expensive common areas that often need renovation, refurbishment. There's the challenge of repurposing large empty spaces that have come available, changing them into different uses where the property is not suitable necessarily for, for those alternative uses, but they come often with development opportunities. And it's really, really important for any shopping centre owner to consider how the shopping centre connects with the rest of the town centre. It might be the largest single owner of property in its town, but and again, back to my local high street, my shopping centre owned by the local authority is about 100 strong in terms of unit number. That's only 20% of the whole of the town centre uh, by, by property number. So it's a large chunk of our town, but that 20% needs to connect well and work with the other 80%. And that's really important to have an overarching policy, not just one for one shopping centre, but for the whole town centre. So public sector investment and development has been taking place over the last uh, few years and lots of examples. This is Banbury, where the local authority not only acquired its shopping centre from a pension fund that wasn't going to undertake uh, a, a regeneration scheme. So the local authority stepped in, uh, acquired the shopping centre, acquired the development site and undertook this um, canal side waterfront development. There's other examples of local authorities stepping in and investing in its town centre through its shopping centres. Shrewsbury is another good example where that's taken place. And public sector investment in shopping centres where regeneration is its goal and its aim, uh, where they're well advised through the process of the purchase and through their uh, management, asset management of the asset is, uh, and there's plenty of good examples where that's worked really well. Other uh, public sector investment um, has been taking places through grant schemes. And there's some really good examples in Belfast, Bristol, Dundalk and Trowbridge where grant schemes which have been uh, provided to landlords and businesses for renovation has worked really well with the local authority running such a grant scheme. In Oxfordshire uh, over 2021-2022 uh, funded by the local enterprise partnership was the meanwhile in Oxfordshire scheme as well. Another positive uh, intervention into empty property, long-standing empty property. Heritage asset loans may be useful um, to provide support for buildings, typically listed buildings. And the, the one I showed you earlier would be a classic example of a property that's crying out for a heritage asset loan to improve it uh, physically um, so that it's um, the landlord and or the business that takes occupation um, are not perhaps saddled with the responsibilities of maintaining the listed building. Um, a loan might come along to, to support them um, uh, through this uh, heritage asset facility. 
It's another great example. Times are changing. The market is adapting slowly, but it is adapting. And here in Paul, we've got a lovely example of a private landlord that owns the, the, the shopping centre, also owning one of the adjacent streets. My last visit to Paul, this particular street was uh, full of empty units, boarded up, looking very, very sorry for itself. But this particular owner has recognised the need to intervene, the need to uh, renovate, um, and has offered two year rent free periods to its um, tenants taking on these pr premises in the hope and expectation that those businesses will then beyond that commit to remain within the town, not necessarily as one of its tenants, but potentially, but supporting the whole town centre um, uh, through its um, intervention and through that positive asset management policy. Now, the changing times and changing relationships has meant there is greater scope for negotiation by tenants taking on leases, looking for more flexibility in lease length, looking for um, appropriate rent levels to be paid, uh, perhaps um, looking for turnover rents rather than the upwards only traditional rent, seeking the lease flexibility and offering opportunities for meanwhile uses. So the changing relationship, the changing market is filtering through and having some positive benefits. What do we mean by community investment? Well, in um, Dun Dumfries, for example, what's known as the Steeple Quarter project, the community has itself acquired six of its town centre properties. Now it's done that with uh, financial support from the Scottish Government, um, the lottery, also the local authority, and other bodies, as well as the general support of town businesses and town community. It's enabled those properties to be renovated and offered back to the community, to the town, to local businesses for both long-term and short-term meanwhile uses. It's made a tremendous difference to its, um, to its high street. The other example on this slide is in Hastings, where um, some of the work um, here has been supported through the Jericho Road Group um, and their uh, work around the subject of self-renovating neighbourhoods. Now, what is meant by that is often properties can be acquired and held sort of by a third party in a, in a sort of distant kind of uh, style where the local community aren't themselves the owners and the beneficiaries of, of the properties. So what um, the example in uh, Hastings provides us with is um, where people are taking collective action can transform their neighbourhoods without losing their neighbourhoods. So Rock, Rock House is a local social enterprise. It took a 1969 largely empty office building and converted it into a range of uses um, with creative collaborative space for living, working and community action. With a couple of um, very fundamental elements at its core, one being its capped rents and its other being that it's self-managed by its tenants who participate and socialise and collaborate together to inform the space and shape the space and the way it's managed. Clearly there are lots of different examples of community investment taking place across the country um, and there are groups and organisations which support such. Uh, in the further reading uh, I've given more details about these two examples uh, but other organisations that are involved in supporting um, groups to acquire, groups to occupy property, to seek to uh, reclaim their town centres for themselves, for the local community. Now, any talk and discussion about high streets um, needs to include a focus on the occupiers. Occupiers make up our town centres. They form a, a they form the occupiers within the town centre. They're the people, the businesses, the organisations, the enterprises which uh, make it vibrant, which bring it to life, uh, which create the the excitement uh, for our places. And um, it's, it's excellent to sort of think through um, the different opportunities there are for startups to test the water, to take on short term leases, to then take um, and acquire the confidence to take longer term leases, to then um, approach landlords with a with a sound business plan that's sort of got some credibility, that's had um, 
uh, you know, opportunity to be tested, uh, to go on and, and grow. The grant schemes that I refer to are really helpful for, for that. And the business support that um, groups, uh, local authorities can provide to, uh, to these new businesses um, and smaller independent uh, businesses can be really, really helpful. Taking them through the, le the lease process, helping them negotiate their rents, helping them think through the next stages, not necessarily signing up for another five-year lease, perhaps thinking about what they want to do, maybe helping them think about buying the property themselves. Leases come with benefits as well. It's not all one-sided in terms of the landlord. Um, leases with security of tenure rights um, uh, do provide to businesses um, a, a long-term way of occupying property without going through um, the pain of, uh, of funding a purchase, but over a period of time, having that knowledge that they are able to take on that property to hold it for 10, 15, 20 years. The lease gives them those rights to, to, to have it for that long. That can go through changing different owners, but the lease remains, carries on through those different owners, provided there's no landlord break clause and provided end of leases come with security of tenure rights uh, that are intact. The lease hasn't been contracted out of the uh, security of tenure rights, the business knows it can continue in occupation, can continue to expand, knows that it can write off its investment, and fit out and renovation and modernization costs along the length of the lease. So it can and does provide great advantages. So our towns need and do provide a mix of uses. We haven't yet referred to residential in town centres is probably a subject in itself for one of these webinars, the, the benefits of town centre living, what that means. And there's great examples of conversion schemes of upper floors into apartments. There's great examples of new build schemes um, taking place in our towns, not just of apartments, but of streets, of houses. Uh, lots of different examples with healthy high streets. So we've got different medical uses, um, the NHS bringing, um, their facilities into the community, into town centres, supporting footfall. We've got a great example in this slide of uh, offices, dedicated offices and co-working. This is happens to be in the centre of Vista, one of my uh, local high streets, where you've got a great town centre space, well designed, thought through by the um, operator, bringing in the natural light from the front towards the middle and the back of the space through its um, glazing. And these types of uh, places and others are great supporters of social enterprise, those businesses, those enterprises that are seeking to provide something positive for their towns. So hopefully over the course of this webinar, we've learned a number of different things. We've understood the different landlord and tenant perspectives. We've considered the different mix of ownerships in our towns and what that might mean. We um, I hope I hopefully have understood the need to sort of build relationships with our landlords and their property agents. We are encouraged to have a policy for our empty shops. Don't leave it to the property market to resolve and sort it out because it won't. What about those properties that have been empty for over six months? What's happening with those? What is holding them back from becoming occupied? What can we do as a town, as a local authority, um, to, to make changes? What different policies could we implement? Do we know who the landlords are? Are we in contact with them regularly? There are different people and organisations that can help us with our empty shops policy, consider what we can do about them. There is considerable weight of occupier demand. There's a lot of people, businesses, enterprises looking for property, but there's often a gap between them and the landlord. And that bridge, that gap needs to be filled. There's a great range of uses um, from residential to retail and everything in between, filling our towns with exciting uses. And there are different ways of intervening into our towns to overcome some of the barriers, some of the problems that we're facing. And I've hopefully shared some of those examples with you um, during this session. But we must include our communities. Our communities want to not just uh, enjoy our town spaces, um, also to occupy, also to own our buildings. Our communities use our towns, our communities um, you know, connect with our towns. It's where 
we collide and socialize with one another in, in positive ways and our community need to be included in all of our discussions and strategies around town centres. So this um, brings to an end uh, this particular webinar on town centre assets and investment. It's one of a number of resources available through the High Street's um, task force resources uh, online. Um, there are additional readings and resources available to you on this particular subject. And if you've enjoyed this session and you want to contact me, uh, give me some examples that you've been working on, um, please feel free to make contact. My email's on the screen, neil at wild-property.co.uk. I'd love to hear from you and uh, appreciate your time in listening to this session today.